Hello, good morning, and welcome to News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. I'm your host, Samson Ladi Anyanini. If you stop, the virus stops. But if you move, the virus moves. That's according to Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, Education Minister. The president renders it even better. The front line of the fight against coronavirus is your front door. If you cross it, you and your family will likely be infected. So, please stay at home. That's the president, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado. Now, as you hear the figures, heading 600,000 people getting infected, heading to 30,000 people dying, don't think you are a special species. Those numbers are human lives, real human lives. I've heard a story of a woman who, in the US, has lost four of her relatives' siblings in one week. If you imagined yourself in her situation, you may not need the president issuing an order for you to stay at home or to be careful. We'll be right back to deal with the vex matters as regards Ghana's preparation after the lockdown. You're welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. I have a very quick take, and I title it The Oversight That, that Might Hurt. Fix the Media In. So, as you know, I'm sure most of us had come to a point where we did not need the political leadership or even leaders at our various workplaces or families to take a decision to be intentional and personal about protecting ourselves and ensuring that we are safe. Even before decisions were taken to shut down, as it were, churches, I know some of you had taken your decision because you were following what was happening in the world. And you didn't think yourself a special species that coronavirus may not hurt. Even before that, whilst leadership may have been slow at that point, some of you were wise enough not to attend a registration exercise because an entity decided to endanger the vulnerable. That entity may have required an empty court judgment to now face safe by announcing that it has suspended the exercise. I have no doubt that that exercise, if it had not been suspended, you would not have attended it. Truth is, as I sit here, do I feel safe? Am I comfortable leaving my home and coming here? The answer is an emphatic no. But on this occasion, I need to serve God and country. Now here is the oversight I say must be fixed and immediately. In the announcements made by the president, very bold 
sounding comprehensive measures to safeguard all of us, the media was left out. Don't listen to anybody who says the media is in or the media is in the law. In the act itself, Parliament left out the media in the exemptions provision. What the president announced, though, represents only an announcement without the backing of law. What the president did last night, until and unless he has reduced that into what is known as an EI, an executive instrument, it does not have the backing of law. Here is my plea. Fix the media in the EI and now. I know that you should be working on the EI that hopefully by Sunday or early Monday, it will be ready for enforcement. Now, guess what? Don't dare disobey the orders of the president as they will be contained in the EI and backed by same. Because if you did, you could look to paying as much as 12,000 Ghana cities or 60,000 Ghana cities for simply not taking the advice to protect yourself. You could be facing 12,000 to 60,000 Ghana cities. Or, in addition to that, you could be put into jail for a minimum of four years or up to 10 good years. Don't take this for a joke. Coronavirus is here. That's my take. Now, let's get to meet my guests this morning and get to discuss the issues concerning coronavirus and see how we can help you to further appreciate what is going on across the globe to further appreciate what is happening in Italy, that within 24 hours, almost a 1,000 people die. You are not any special. So let's see if our guests will assist us to do that and do that very well. And let's see also how we get to understand deeper the president's instructions meant to protect yourself and your family and the collective. If you dare move out of it, you are endangering not only yourself, but myself and the collective. And we will not allow you to do that. My guest this morning, Dr. Patrick Abouadje, is Director, General Ghana Health Service. Thanks for making the time to come here again Thank today. Yeah. Also, Professor Alfred Edwin Fifi Yorson, his physician, public health consultant, academic and researcher at the University of Ghana Medical School. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Right. We will be joined on the phone by a couple of experts to assist us. That will be for the first segment. And in the second segment, we will have yet another group of panelists assisting us, whilst we even try right here to observe social distancing. Mm -hmm. So a good number of the people we'll deal with will be by phone. Now, if you have any lack of understanding and you need clarity on the president's directives, let's have it by way of text message, and we shall have our guest assist you to appreciate them. Right. Let's listen to the president briefly on his fourth address to the nation regarding how many deaths or infections the country has recorded so far and what measures have been put in place. Ghana had recorded 21 confirmed cases of infections, with virtually all the cases being imported. I took the step to close all our borders, 
and I ordered a mandatory quarantine and testing of all the 1,030 persons who arrived at the airport at the time of the announcement till the day the borders were closed. Indeed, 78 of the persons put under quarantine have since tested positive for the virus. It is these additional confirmations that have increased dramatically our total number of cases to 137. Indeed, 97% of all confirmed cases are travelers who brought the disease from outside our shores. Of the remaining 59 confirmed cases, 53 are receiving treatment and are doing well, and they will be discharged should their second test results prove negative. 14 of them are being managed at home in self-isolation. Four persons who were tested positive for the virus, but were aged and had other serious underlying medical conditions, have lost their lives. May their souls rest in perfect peace. Thankfully, two persons have made full recovery. Right. So let me begin with um, Professor Alfred Yosin, who is joining us for the first time on this show. Uh, he's physician, public health consultant, he's an academic, he's a researcher, and he's with the University of Ghana Medical School. Um, you listened to the president last night, I suppose? Yes, I did. And from a public health perspective, what would you say about the steps that the president is rolling out? I think for any public health emergency of this proportion, some context-specific measures are important. So as the president rightly said, we do not need to exactly copy what others are doing. We need to take our sociocultural circumstances, our economic circumstances into consideration mm -hmm. and put in measures that ultimately, as much as possible, try to let people stay home. That is the bottom line. Whatever mm -hmm. measures you put in, you will want people to stay home and not disrupt their everyday life as much as possible. Mm. Earlier in the week, the Education Minister, Dr. Matthew Puku Prempe, had given a line I thought that was going to lead me in discussing these issues. His summary was that if you stop, the virus stops. If you move, the virus moves. Across the globe, it does appear the only medicine so far which is proving to be effective is stay home. How can that be done effectively? within our circumstances. Yes, it is important. Human diseases and diseases affecting population all over has similar characteristics. So I was happy when you mentioned we shouldn't think we are immune from corona and that what is happening elsewhere will not affect us. Human beings behave similarly depending on where you are and then the technologies might change. We need to understand that as we move, rightly the virus will move and therefore in these times we should be sincere with ourselves ours is a communal communitarian society all for each and each for all so we should as much as possible see whatever actions we take as for public good and that is not only for us it's for our family it's for our colleagues and for the entire nation mm. so the bottom line is as much as possible non-essential movement from home should be curtailed and we don't need to get to a point where we will require enforcement, high-handedness by security or anybody. We as a people should be sincere with ourselves and see our health as our ultimate responsibility, protect others, protect ourselves, and we will be able to defeat this epidemic. Right. So, Dr. Bwaji, you should actually be at the forefront, and you are yeah. leading the Ghana Health Service. You are happy about what the president has done? <coughs> Last yeah. week you were here, yeah. and I asked you, if you were to advise the president, what would be your advice? You said, lockdown, time is now. 
the Ghana Medical Association issued a statement asking the president lock down. Lock down in whatever variants it, it may be. They said lock down. Has the president come out a bit too late? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I, I really wouldn't say that. And last week I said, if you look at the epidemiology of all infectious diseases, the earlier you lock down, the better. But the world and the people, there are other circumstances that has to be done. And you need to put all those things in context before you rush into a lockdown that will fail. And so I think the president has come around at the right time because we have had incremental steps that sought to restrict movement, that sought to ensure that um, imports are reduced, that sought to ensure that um, transmission is curtailed, especially community transmission. And so I believe that it's the right time because you need to really tie the knot and make sure that um, if you are going to, you don't just lock down and sleep. When you lock down, you need to take specific steps, mm -hmm. including testing and testing. And, and so all that has to be put in place. Otherwise, you lock down and only, uh, it's just a waste of time. So I think the time is quite right. Mm. A again, back to you, you know, Professor Singh. Do you think we have done this at the right time or could have been done a little earlier? Looking from the experience, we are learning how Italy is paying, you know, dearly for being a bit slow. The UK decided to get ahead of Italy. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that it may get the results it's looking for. Even the people who are leading the UK's, you know, fights. The Prime Minister, the Health Secretary, all just discovered yesterday by testing that they have coronavirus. The medical chief, who together with them were doing all the announcements, leading in the media front and telling the people stay home, do X, Y, Z, is also isolating. Have we acted at the best time? All right. From a purely public health point of view, without consideration of economic, social, and other factors, you write in saying that we could have acted earlier. Purely from the public health point of view, we could have prevented people from coming in the country once we saw that the cases were being imported. But as I said, this must be done in consideration with other factors. And therefore, we will not fault so much what we have done because there have been incremental activities going on. We've been tracing, we've been contact tracing, we've quarantined people. We are doing all that uh, public health measures will require. And as it is now, I think we should forge ahead and try to increase whatever effort we have put in and try to contain the epidemic. Yes. Interesting. Um, right. What, what, what would you say, uh, Dr. Abuaji, that since we started to discover community infections, did we need to wait even a minute or an hour or a day? And these measures as announced by the president are not in effect until Monday. Well, uh, well thank you very much. You see, generally, the initial phases were all imports, and that is why we stopped the we started screening at the ports, doing risk assessment and following them up. Yeah. We realized that that was not enough because people were not as disciplined as they were expected to do self-isolation and protect their loved ones around. And so we had to now step it up. Um, cases that were found were followed up. They were self-isolating. We've mixed, we follow them up twice a day. Uh, fortunately, I think just about one or so, 10 positive uh, eventually of all those cases. But then you, you go around and see, well, this uh, community, people may have slipped in. And so if there's a slipping, you keep on observing to see whether there's community. But still, despite even now, despite all that, we cannot even count more than four people that we cannot say they have 
is community. Everybody, a significant number, even the very last one that came in, is also someone who just arrived from UK eight days ago, before the quarantine. So, um, I wouldn't say, because we see, apart from that, there were other district level measures, surveillance, identification, and if you notice, we are only hearing that we have 137 cases. We have tested over thousands of people who were negative because in the least suspicion, we test you. So, so, those are, so I don't still think that it's coming out late because um, you, you lock up someone dies from pregnancy-related complications. And, and all the, those things. And, uh, by, so you need to be By prepared. the World Health Organization standard, mm -hmm. the best approach now is test test and test test isolate quarantine <laughs> are we doing and isolate. are we doing the emphasis they say is testing yes are we doing enough testing we can look at other developed countries perhaps we are not at their stage yeah but in the US in New York in California you will see as they you know run into the hundred of thousands mm -hmm. They, they have gone beyond 100,000 within a very short space of time. The reason they were able to do that is because they were testing. We are testing very limited numbers, are we not? Well, currently we are testing based on the case definition, whether you've um, con um, symptoms, etc. But this part of this um, measures now is to test all contacts, test as many people, as contacts as possible, and also eventually we will need to now do more community surveillance testing. But there has to be a reason to test. We have to have a reason Explain to that. test. Community es surveillance testing. Especially hotspots, mm. where you feel that we are receiving one, two, three, too many cases. You can decide to test at random, test many people. And then you'll be able to see what is there, what is going on. Do you need to have one, two, three, or you need just one? Do you agree with the expert view also? Uh -huh. And I suppose the last time I asked you, you all of you who were here seem to have agreed. Where they say, where you discover one, mm -hmm. chances are you have not discovered as many as ten. Well, I mean, these are things you can you can you can talk about you can you can assume this this is what brings it very but graphic see, and to, to home to me yes and whilst we preach spread calm i like us to spread the facts no. and let people decide how they treat them i'm just in wa yes we heard the news yes somebody got here got into public transport and went to wa yes we heard about the rich hospital somebody was there for a number of days did not disclose that he had just returned from, you know, uh, uh, abroad. Then he had made contacts with the health workers in excess of, say, 15 or so. Only later, he dies, minutes later, it is discovered that his uh, samples that were tested proves he is positive. Let's say he encountered 15 people in this hospital these 15 other people who didn't think that this was a case, have gone elsewhere, have gone to their homes, they may have put their families in danger. The man who traveled all the way to Wa uh, would have put several other people in danger. So is it not just one that you need, or you need more than one to begin to do the testing you are talking about in the community? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Maybe it is, for example, the rich one is not as straightforward as you are putting it. Mm. All health workers, as I mean, by first principle, protect themselves, mm. especially in this. So we would not really uh, assume that everybody who went around him was not protected. And I believe that my information is that uh, they were protecting themselves. But of course, you need to continue uh, self isolating and testing to see, to be sure. Yes, um, in testing, uh, it's not as simple as you make. There's a, there's a capacity to test. There are systems that have to be available to be able to test and report and respond. And so as the condition starts, 
the system, um, as of 7th January, when it was announced, it was not like people were preparing for Corona. And so you respond, and you prepare, and escalate your response. And exactly that's what we are doing. So, for example, any case we see, immediately we start contract tracing. Anybody who was in that bus will be looked for, we traced, and contact uh, tested, and also have their additional contacts, if necessary, uh, tested. And all those people How effective in. is this contact tracing? Because people have their doubts no. that someone gets into public transport from Accra all the way to Wa, mm -hmm. and you are sure that person that you will find the people in that bus and test them or take them through the process. You see, as a, at the initial stage, we are told all intercity people to start taking contact details of all, and they are doing it. STC and they are all doing it. So that information will be available for us to quickly round them up and, and test them. Mm -hmm. And for the, 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 the Oboasi case, I think it got to Oboasi a day after, where well, we had immediately had about 30 contacts. They've all been followed up and uh, tested and they are being followed up. So, so those are the way we, we do, but we can decide the, the what to do. The 30 contacts that you discovered with the Oboasi incident, mm -hmm. had those contacts also made other contacts? When I say 30, contacts, that yeah. is the, the number that we assume are contacts, significant contacts. Mm. So it's not just the first contacts, but other contacts are rounded up, and then we, we, we look at them. Okay. And so we, we, we do a lot of that. Currently, of the people we have followed up, about 204 of them have completed a 14 days follow up, and so they're out. Okay. And it continues to expand. Mm. And so that's how it's done. And so um, the numbers have gone up. Because of the of the quarantine and the and the, and the number, definitely. And, so, and those are people mm. who never got into the system. Right. So that was a very important move. Mm. And these are people that it was easy to get and quarantine. Yes. Because they were coming through the airport. Yes. And and the we chances have similar, are we chances have similar are systems in place at the border mm. at the at the at the, borders. At the land borders. Yes. Yes, but same. when you tell us of these numbers, mm -hmm. you don't give us numbers of persons coming through the land borders. Well, usually they were insignificant flowers. I think they were about three mm. and they're about so, so, so. Okay. But they're all part of the team. We have right. places where we kept and tested them. Okay. And um, Professor Yossing and, and, and Dr. Bwaji, please forgive me the way I'm looking at this. No problem. But uh, I want us to look at the facts and begin to uh, get everybody ready because see even as the president has issued these directives and they are a question of law that people who breach will suffer you know the penalties for it you can be sure that people will seek to to breach them he i refer to the contact with the health workers at uh, ridge and he says look they have, they protect themselves ordinarily. The 9,000 or so deaths in Italy includes over 10% being health workers. What is being done, do you know, to ensure that the health workers who will serve us will not do so in danger? Thank you very much. A lot of measures are being put in place from the level of the Ministry, Ghana Health Service, and national level. We have a national level team conducting trainings as a trainer of trainers, and then these trainers will go to their facilities and conduct trainings. And all public health institutions, both at the national and regional level, as well as the district level, are also conducting training for frontline workers. Mm. And education is ongoing, materials are being produced, and importantly, we will need a PPE, personal protective equipment for these health workers, and how to appropriately use them. them. Because it's not just having them, but how to appropriately use them. It's also important. And these efforts are going on, I must say, quite a lot of effort go on behind the scenes, <laughs> but it's not seen, yeah. unfortunately. But we are encouraging 
the whole of Ghanaians, people who visit the health facility, to be sincere, yeah. disclose. There is no stigma attached to this. And as we know, key personalities have come out to declare their status. So there is nothing wrong with you telling us, I've been here, I've been there, I have come into contact with. That is the only way health workers will be protected. Because if you don't do that and you come and get into contact with so many health workers, imagine one patient coming and taking out about 15 health workers who are already stretched on the ground. And you take out 15 who should be in quarantine for 14 days. Who is going to see our normal, usual patient who will come with hypertensive complication, diabetic complication, which will not stop because corona is here. So we are appealing to Ghanaians folks coming to the hospital to be sincere declare your status so you don't put the health workers who will take care of us in danger that is absolutely not on at all the the, the president yeah. spoke about uh, ppes yeah. and other things that have come in 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 very large quantities yeah. um let's listen to the president outlining the materials that have been purchased so far and then i'll ask a question about that and I'll go on the phone lines also to have um, Jibril Yahya Lua, who is a respiratory thera therapist at the uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Uh, let's hear the president on the things that have been purchased and then come to continue this discussion. It's very important that we protect all healthcare providers with personal protective equipment to make sure that they do not contract the virus in the process of protecting our lives. Government has therefore taken delivery of additional PPEs and more are being procured. Distribution of 17,000 coveralls, 350,000 masks, 17,000 goggles, 2,400 non-contact thermometers, 350,000 gloves, 25,000 sanitizers, and 30,000 test kits are ongoing for healthcare personnel and those undertaking contact tracing and testing. We're recruiting 1,000 community health workers and an additional 1,000 volunteers to help in this endeavor. 100 pickup vehicles and 2,500 tablets have been mobilized for the exercise. Fellow Ghanaians, I'm urging all of you to bear with these additional measures. They are being done in the interest of all of us. They are hopefully only for a short while. These additional measures, together with those earlier announced, are what will help us defeat the virus. And we must be united in our determination and efforts to overcome this challenge. Right, so last week you said we we're expecting a lot more. Yeah. We got to understand that the Jack Ma Foundation had brought us is it thirty thousand um, how many of test them? Kits, twenty thousand okay. test kits, about hundred thousand plus okay. DPEs or something. All like right, that. great. And so that is inclusive of what the president is talking to us this about. This is additional. This additional. Okay. So these are specifically for the frontline workers, the health, health of professionals, nurses, doctors. What the president outlined is what we are being added just for the response of getting homes, contact tracing, getting people tested and then um, and, and follow up. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. But I think that in PPEs have continued to come in. Mm. And we must thank our partners. A lot of them have brought in, uh, donated um, a lot. Um, Tobinko yesterday, GIPC also brought us a thousand. Right. And these are all being quickly. Individuals are, are also doing Individuals are also yeah. doing that. Mm. We're really grateful to them. Can they Japan among others? Yeah. But you see, when PPE, like Prof said, you have to wear them appropriately. You must also have the discipline to keep them on. And that's something that we need to also tell our health workers. Mm. PPEs vary based on what you're going to do. 
are the outpatients when you are encountering patients, you probably just need a, a, a gloves and a mask. The overalls and the coveralls are used for treatment, taking samples, and so they change as and when you do. So when um, people also complain, I don't have. I met a nurse at one of the hospitals, and I said, "Do you have PPEs?" I said, "I don't have one." This person was at the OPD wearing an N95 mask. So, so what do you want? What do you think call PPE? You know. So we need to really have that understanding. And also a lot of training on what you need and how to use them continues to go on. Mm. And as we continue flooding the system with PPEs, uh, we'll look at that. Um, one thing that we need to also be very clear about is the fact that this is not, I would say, in quotes, a killer disease, but it's a very disruptive disease. If I, I live here and God forbid I turn positive, all of you have to self-isolate. Mm. Okay, yeah. I went to your studio, I got someone, got mic to me, etc. They all have to solve us late. Mm. It's a very disruptive thing. And so we need to get out there that it is not a killer disease like Ebola that kills 7 out of 10 people. And so it is important that you come out early, protect yourself, your loved ones and everybody. And so people must cooperate so that we can protect. Because it's the fact that you are positive doesn't mean you are dead. And we must have that. If you don't do that and we create that panic and fear. People are going to resort to all kinds of places and uh, in the initial phase of HIV, when people were professing that we have disease, a lot of herbalists and traditional people got it because they were trying to do all kinds of things. We must avoid that. We don't want this thing to go underground. Any time people start, we create a stigma and people go underground. Obviously, we will. And we don't want to also stigmatize people that we, we suspect as high risk. We want them to to own up, open up, so that we can also contain this. And it's very important, mm. if we don't get that, these two weeks will not be very useful. Then people must cooperate with the people who come to their homes, follow them up and talk to them and take their information and take samples, and then we'll be able to respond. Right. Let's get on the phone and um, bring on Jibril Yahya um, uh, on, on Skype. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Hello, Jibreel. Hello, Jibreel. Hello, Jibreel. Hello. Hello. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Samson. Uh, and, uh, good morning. All right. So to start with, as a respiratory therapist, uh, corona, the coronavirus is basically a respiratory, you know, challenge. So how do you want everybody else and also particularly the government in taking the steps to protect everybody else to, you know, look at this? Uh, in, in the first place, I would uh, like everybody to give the advice being issued out by the government. One, for everybody uh, to protect himself by social distancing. Make sure you, 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 you wash your hands as frequently as possible. And, uh, you know, stay home. Because right now, you know, we are at the initial stages of this disease. And clearly, when you look at New York area, you know, this disease is already wreaking havoc. You know, and I, as I could hear from your panelists, you know, so far, all that we keep on hearing is about PPEs and other uh, protective equipment that uh, uh, is required by the health work, which is true. But as this disease progresses, it's going to get to a time where we're going to have critical patients. And uh, if you follow the news throughout the world lately, everybody is talking about ventilators, ventilators. Ventilated. And so far, I've not heard any public official tell us about, you know, if we have them or the government is making any effort to acquire them. It's very critical, you know, in our planning towards COVID-19 for us to try as much as possible to start ventilating. Because right now, most of the patients that are in critical state will require ventilatory support. And a ventilator is just a piece of equipment. 
that, you know, will support the patient who, who is in that respiratory distress or respiratory failure to help the patient breathe while the patient, the immune system is trying to fight the disease since we don't have vaccine or treatment for, 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 for COVID-19. But at this time, throughout our conversation, I've never heard anybody talk about ventilators, whether we have them, how many do we have, and if we are making any effort to acquire them, you know. All and right. So, 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 Jibril, just hold on, hold on briefly for me. Let me bring in Dr. Abwaje. And is it last week or two weeks ago? Last week, I asked the question that ventilators are very central. You said, let's get there. Well, well um, I, we, we have been preparing and we are procuring ventilators. What we are also trying to avoid in the initial phases is to, to limit the number of people who will get into that state so that we don't know that. We have um, uh, improved our ventilator count. We have been, been bringing about 100 more. I think about 20 has already arrived. Uh, we've taken stock of all our ventilators across the country and um, we are bringing in more. We have um, all our treatment centers, we have specialized uh, uh, section for... Uh, That's for the ICUs. For the ICUs. And, uh, you know, you need to have an isolated ICU. You cannot just put the ICUs everywhere because uh, any time you put a COVID person in, in the, an, an ICU, then it means that everybody is there it's to shut the whole place. So we have one place where we can send them the mm -hmm. ICUs, uh, in Kolebu, we have ICU at Ridge. We have even the East place where we are using now, we have ICU there. We are putting about seven or so ventilators there. And so we are not oblivious of that. And mm. so we are responding and appropriate. We are actually ensuring that we are building capacity. It's not just ventilator, mm. but you must train people to also manage them. All that has been done. So you have a done account and how many ventilators are in effective use? or can be used presently in Ghana? How many ventilators are we talking about? Well, I believe that with the, with the, with the, with the ramp up and the fact that all the other private sector has also ready to assist, we can do more than 100 or 200 ventilators. But I know that we have about 67 that we can rely on the public sector mm -hmm. now. And then with the ramp up now, with all the additions from the other hospitals that we are, we are working with, mm. we have an additional number mm. that is available should we use. We have the Deborah Ward, which will be ready very soon with about 18 ventilators. That's not part of the, what we are talking about. And mm. so in all our training centers, all our treatment centers across the regions, on all regions, we are areas where we'll be able to send those who need uh, specialized care. All right. Yes, but you see, it's yeah. such a... Mm. Mm. Uh, an area that everybody struggles, yeah. including America. And yes. so the initial New intervention York alone is, is looking for 30,000 yes. ventilators. They have 4,000. They are not excited yes. about it. Um, yesterday, Trump, you know, you know, using the law at his mm -hmm. disposal, just it's issued a command asking GM to begin to make uh, ventilators. Yes. In the UK, we had uh, dry sin coming in to manufacture as many as uh, 100,000 and they, uh, no, the UK is asking for 10,000 yeah. of the ventilators. So you say you are, ask, you are looking for more. Yes, sir. Where are you looking for these? Where are they coming from? Because it does appear where they would come from, they need them first and they are now manufacturing what they need to save, to save their people. I mean, that's part of the, the, the challenge with COVID, including test case, et cetera. But we are, we are making success, and because some of them have been procured, some of them are already coming, and we are bringing them up. So maybe uh, that's why I keep saying that the essence is to start the containment early so that you do not have to deal so much at mm. the end. And so that's why all these measures all right. are So let me important. get to, back to Jibreel, because this is uh, part of his area and interest. Um, so... Um, when we get to the critical stage, immediately so, we have capacity for 100 people. How does that sound to you? And it continues to increase. It's not just. Seriously, you, you, 
we need to start moving because it's clear to me that we, we even not just this pandemic, we need to be really prepared. And I'm calling on the government to try as much as possible to acquire more of these ventilators. We don't have to wait for this. Because right now, as you're saying, Trump just invoked the DP, the Defense Protective Act, to ask other companies to manufacture more ventilators. We need to have them, and we need to build capacity. Clearly, you know, from what Prof is saying right now, you know, if we don't have that many of them, which means we don't have the capacity, enough capacity to manage them, because if we don't have them, there's not that much people trained to manage these ventilators. And this should be an effort that we need to uh, look towards and try and build capacity and try and acquire more of these ventilators. At this crucial moment, we need to get them before we need them. We have to. Because so far, almost all the critical patients in, in New York and elsewhere require ventilatory support. Most of them go into respiratory failure. And since there is no cure, there is no treatment, there is no vaccine, the only way to support them is to place them on life support, which is the ventilator, to breathe for them while the body fight, you know, the, the immune system fight to treat itself or, or, or to get rid of the COVID-19. So right. I'm, I'm calling on the government mm. to try and make an effort and acquire more of the ventilator. Mm. 100, I don't think it's enough. We need to do more. Okay, so he said 100. He but, said 100 is what we may be able to guarantee today. today, but more should come. He's talking about 20 more and. Yes, 20 have uh, arrived. Yes, 20 have arrived. Yes. Oh, that's inclusive no, of this no, to no, make it. No, no, no. no okay, no, all right, no. all right. Okay, so, but Jibri, you say this is not enough. A lot more has to be done, right? Yes, this is not enough. We need to get more ventilators. Okay. At least a country like Ghana, we need to have at least a thousand ventilators. I know it's an expensive piece of equipment. At least one costs between twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. You know, that's the average price. So, you know, I know it's expensive, but it's a life support machine that we need at this critical moment. Mm. So the government has to make an effort and acquire more of these ventilators. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jibril Yahya Lua. He's respiratory. Uh, therapist um, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Um, now, Prof. Yossin, the what's the place of ventilators in all of this discussion? I follow elsewhere in the UK and the US, and they seem to suggest that a ventilator is the difference between the virus and life. Absolutely. Absolutely, because the progression of the disease currently as we don't have a vaccine we don't have any confirmed effective treatment and most people who will get the severe disease will go into respiratory problems and that is the only way you can help them to survive so critically ill persons from covid will require ventilatory support that's about five percent of those who are critically ill and that Therefore, it should be part of the whole arsenal that we are going to use. And as Dr. Boaji rightly said, efforts are being made. I know Kwabinya is uh, the Gang East place is currently being prepared actively and in the regions as well. So it should be a core part of our response mm. to yes, and it's part of it. We will want as much as possible, detect early, manage most of them conservatively, symptomatically without getting a lot more of the critical cases because in fact when we get a lot more of the critical cases our system will be overwhelmed that mm. one as it is shown in even most uh, developed countries so as Gibril rightly said we need more of the ventilators we need to train more unfortunately uh, corona has exposed most health systems in the world the areas we have yeah. neglected over the years ICU care, intensive care, training of anesthetists, training of ICU nurses. These are core areas going forward we may need to actively mm. look at. And so train. you and Dr. Boaji agree that we are looking about at about 5% of those who be infected who will be in such critical condition that they will need ventilators. Yes. Elsewhere, yes. elsewhere, they are able 
to project the numbers that they expect to get infected and out of that number you can work out the average of the ventilation ventilator need do we have any idea in this country what we are looking forward to before we get to talk about flattening the curve yes i think the surveillance department of the health service make projections and we have spot maps to indicate where the cases are coming from whether they are clustering in other areas and if each one potentially can infect others so we have numbers we have projected mm. numbers i can't produce it now but we have projected numbers the We've science is that scenarios. one person is potential can potentially infect as many as how many 15 to 20 i think within and if nothing, if nothing is within uh, within what period of time because we have also heard from the experience in wuhan and elsewhere that one person <coughs> can infect within weeks, weeks within weeks in the thousands yes that is if nothing is done with our surveillance systems in place social, try, distance. social distances trying to uh, hygiene. quarantine hand hygiene and all that these are measures that will mitigate the spread and therefore we will continue to encourage the public to take this measure so my question again is doc what are the projections out of which we can estimate our five percent and prepare for it if you're going to war you ought to have a strategy uh, pro pro projections we, we asked we like you said we looked at the the, um, the case currently we are having about um 137 i would really put it at a 59 but the 78 are clearly not we cannot use that into to the projections but we may assume that others may have slipped in some of which has been identified and so um, we have projected that remember that even the uh, the ventilators there are people who need them anyway mm -hmm. yeah. who need the yeah, ventilators, as we speak yeah as we speak not mm -hmm. because they have corona yeah. so yeah. They, they are there and so as we run up the, the the curve our curve is not going to be the flattening curve with our approach we are going to use what we are going to use because of rapid testing we're going to test we are going to have a very steep rise in our curve, and then a, a sleep decline. We are, we are approaching more like the, the, the Korean approach, where we do, we expect a very sharp rise, sharp because, rise they because they are testing a lot, and then as we manage, it comes out. And so based on all that, we'll be able to, uh, we'll continue, you see, you have to continue So the projection, the figures, what are you UK, looking at? Look, uh, the, Boris Johnson uh, was, was bold to tell the people in the UK that get ready, this, you will die, that's for setting, but this is how we'll solve it. Depends on... By this yeah, time. It depends on... We have not gotten to the search. Yeah. Countries in the search, you, it's very easy to, to see project. project. But we are not in the search yet. And that's but the why countries that are in the search mm -hmm. began like you have. Yes, and there are countries that did not get a search, and they began like we have begun. And so you have to look at it in, in that sense. Yes. There are countries that were in the same way and they were never got into the search. And mm. so it depends on the interventions you do. And then most importantly, how we carry the people with us, how people also comply. There are countries who were, I mean, you could see them on television, so this is nothing, we'll continue to do what we are doing. You know, so, and I can see some groundswell of people really complying and supporting. And so we need to be a bit more um, positive that people are going to comply. You see, like uh, it was said, if the virus doesn't move. Mm -hmm. If you, you don't, don't move. If you don't move, you, the virus, the virus doesn't move. move. Mm. And, uh, and so that's what I mean. If you, the virus doesn't move, then you don't send to somebody. And so you have to, with all those things, we should be able to look at that. I mean, countries like uh, countries that like Japan, etc., they have not gone into. That it depends on how the people react, and that's extremely important. Any country that drives into the stage of mass search and needing so many ventilators, it's, ventilators don't work on their own. No. You need to have people trained, among others. We have about 
400 anesthetic machines that also have ventilators in them. And so, and in, in circumstances where you are this thing, you may be able to resolve to almost all those things. So you, these are not normal types. Mm -hmm. But like I said, there's a lot more uh, ventilators that are coming in. And um, uh, uh, Prof, can you, can you help so I understand and maybe our, our audiences understand why you have a projection of a steep curve? Um, and why is a case different elsewhere? We have seen how in less than a week, or in a matter of a week, you know, New York or elsewhere have recorded, you know, thousands. And we know that they get to know because they are testing. And we know that we don't have that capacity now, and we are not doing that. We are testing very limited group of people that is easy to bring in because they arrive at the airport. Uh, Italy's north, Cremona, effectively prevented, you know, coronavirus by testing and quarantining all its 13,000 citizens for 14 days. So they are absolutely out. Nobody is affected. What are we talking about here? What so, are we doing to give us the assurance of what we are looking at? Excellent. We have put a lot of measures in place initially, as we're saying, trying to, as soon as we got to know these cases are coming in, we stepped up the contact tracing. If we hadn't, then each one of them, as we said, that came in, would have infected so many others who would then be within the community. Not all of them will show symptoms or even come to the health facility, but this will contribute to the burden of disease and they will also continue to spread it. Right. So if you didn't do that, and suddenly you come in and you put everybody together and mm. you test them. That's where you see that steep rising. Okay. Fortunately for us, we have tried to mitigate it yeah. right from the beginning. Now closed our borders, so people are not coming in. So we are trying to deal with the cases inside. Mm. And the cases inside, we are keeping them from contaminating others, as it were. And also trying to trace all those potentially who have come into contact. So as we say, as we test more, we will have cases that have slipped in and it will rise gradually so we shouldn't unduly be so worried if the numbers keep going really? because we are doing the right things if we didn't then these numbers will escalate mm. in the next few weeks so okay yes all right so the decision to test mm. you must have an idea that there is something going Go on ahead. there okay and we are testing i mean how do we test the one in one because the information is out there People, we have situations where even people are saying, oh, you have come from Italy, please go and get tested. Testing. Because the people are aware. Right. And so as soon as that is done, we, we do the testing. So it's not like we are, don't have any system. People just walk in. We mm -hmm. ask people, if you call, if you have a problem, call. Even some of them call my number. And I tell them, call this number. Someone will come to your house. And if they prove, profile you and they feel Our that. Our only two centers, Noguchi and KCCR, must be overwhelmed. Well, I mean, we did, we, cases, uh, Noguchi alone have done more than 1,200 tests in three days. Mm. You know, so, yes. And, and last week you said that we're looking to establish, yes. is it, uh, Tamale two and more? Ho, yes. Two more? Two more. Only two? No, only two. We have about 130 machines that we are currently upgrading to be able to, to use for testing. To be used for testing. We need to be calibrated to be able to do that. So all that is, is being done so to be able please to please get clear with me as far as the numbers are concerned. We're going to have how many testing centers? We can we're going to have four Ho and um, Tamale, KCCR and, and Noguchi. So two we, in addition and to in all of them the, two the capacity presently. can be even expanded to do mm -hmm. more. And we have um, a, a machines that we use for testing tuberculosis among other things, mm. which is going to be going to recalibrate it to be able to also support in the test. Last week you said these two will come on board in two weeks. Where are we? Two weeks is not yet on, but I'm sure we'll do it before, before two weeks. Mm. We'll do it within, before the two weeks. Okay. You are still here on News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform, and my guest helping us to understand this invisible enemy that is on the prowl, just taking lives on its way 
everywhere. My guests will continue to help us to understand how things are going. As they give us the assurance, it does look like we are in some level of control. Uh, the delayed testing that affected other countries, the early uh, lockdowns by countries like in, in Argentina, which gave them a lot of success. They suggest that uh, we could have been earlier, but we are not late. Um, it's the projection that myself and even my listeners don't seem to get uh, sufficient answers from you. Uh, and so I'm getting a lot of uh, questions on that uh, regard. Right. So until, as it were, until Monday, the president's directives, which you are very excited about, mm -hmm. don't kick in. I won't wait for that. What do you say to those who are waiting for that before? they begin to do what the president has asked all of us to do? Well, well thank you. I think we must also, also appreciate Ghanaians that even before it kicked in, mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that were happening. Companies were easing uh, staffing and making sure some are staying home mm -hmm. without prompting. Um, people were not also going out on their own. I'm sure you have noticed that bars and etc. are empty, hotels are empty mm -hmm. because people are already doing that. We hope that uh, people will see the benefit and make sure that they don't unduly expose themselves and expose others. And I think that it should be uh, the media should assist us by preaching this message and also making sure that. We don't create any fear. Mm. Like I said, this is a, a condition, even though it does not have treatment, it's able to resolve by itself. Mm. Currently, we have had, the four days we have had were people uh, aged with other comorbidities, mm. serious uncontrolled comorbidities. Of course, that tips you off. But a significant number have recovered. We have two who are waiting for the second test and say if they're negative, then they are, they are, they are declared. We have one who is automatically been cured. All of them are doing well for us and are being managed at home because they're simple conditions. So I think that is extremely important that people don't just try to avoid the runaway, go and hide and pretend to breathe the same because definitely you don't save yourself and you don't save your loved ones in the community. Mm. But good news for many people, particularly people who have underlying conditions, people who are diabetic, for example, mm -hmm. they are happy about what you say about the ventilators yeah. because they pray that this doesn't come close to them. Yeah. So where exactly have we ordered them from? When are we expecting them? Well, I mean, uh, I will not be able to... I was saying that about uh, 20 are in. Mm. We are ordering about 100 and more. And you see, we have also have ventilators. We're going to start working with either, well, the, the Bank of Ghana Hospital. is going to be part of the place we have. They have about 10 ICUs there. We are going to there. Mm. And this was not part of the number I've given you. Okay. The UGMC is also an area where we have 10 beds, 15 beds that we're also going to use. They're talking a lot about Accra. No. We are talking also about the epicenters, and, and the numbers I'm talking about is mm. all over uh, the country, including the War Regional Hospital that has an ICU. Mm. Okay, so these are all numbers that are available. And I believe that even if uh, we look at the private sector support, which they are also willing to participate, we will have a lot more access to ventilators than mm. we have. I'm just being modest in saying that. These are the ones that are currently in the public sector okay. as we add more. Mm -hmm. Even yesterday, two more ventilators were sent to Kwabinya, so probably that's not part of the 67. Okay. Uh, unlike other countries which are looking inward and getting you know, factories to manufacture them right there, mm -hmm. we can think about that. And that is why the context is very important, that we have to look at our context, ensure that containment 
is done. People are open enough for us to be able to manage them early enough mm. so that we don't really get into into that stage. We don't want situations and all the people who have either stayed home too long and trying to do other things, they are the ones who come in and within a short time we lose them. And so we advise that everybody must cooperate, get tested, and if it's found, mm. you, are, you manage them. Okay. There's 78 we right. found mm. in the quarantine. None of them are sick, and that's what it is. All right. We need to be very careful. All right. Thank you. Now, Prof. Yossin, what, what do you, the same question I put to him, even before the law begins to kick in so that people like to be afraid, people like to do things because they will be, they will be punished if they don't. That's very sad. And where we are talking about people's own lives at stake, it does seem they still need a whip before they will comply. Before the processes kick in on Monday, what will you tell people? Yes, like Dr. Mwaji said, individual responsibility is important. But it is also at this point that we will want to elicit the support of all the community structures that exist. When Otum Fona now said to put a ban that nobody goes out in the evening because there is a barrier, it works. When the Gamanche says there is no drumming, well, dancing, man. or put a ban on drumming and dancing, people comply. So we will want to elicit the support of the traditional authorities right. to come in to support what the president has said. And mm. also groups, the NAT, Tewu, Utah. All those organizations should encourage their members, as well as other community structures, queen mothers, market queens. All yeah. these are important. Yeah. NGOs working in the communities, uh, community-based organizations. These are important structures we can use and get people to comply even before the president directed to come in. So we will encourage all these institutions and agencies to lend a hand of support to encourage Ghanaians. And ultimately, as we said, we appreciate Ghanaians and we encourage them to comply for the safety of their family and all others around them. OK. Thank you very, very much. Um, we will take a break here and return to continue with our next set of guests. You have been watching and listening to Dr. Patrick Abouadje. He is the Director General, Ghana Health Service and Professor Alfred Edwin Fifi Orson, physician, public health consultant, academic, and researcher <laughs> at the University of Ghana Medical School. On the phone, we spoke to Jibril Yaya, who is a respiratory therapist. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Welcome back. This is Newsfile. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. This program is brought to you by the kindest sponsorship of MTN Everywhere You Go, Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and close as a partner. Amen Scientific. God is the healer. Dura Plus. Where Dura Plus goes, water flows. C-O-A-F-S, your immune booster. That's the core FS. That's your immune booster. And you need that even uh, a lot now. We lead. We build home for you. Joy learning. Keep learning in the midst of the emergency and the lockdown. You can still learn on joy learning. All you need is your Digibox. Right, so my guests uh, for this segment, Dr. Justice Youngson, my friend, colleague, who is also a practicing physician, General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. Thank you very much for making time for us, sir. Thank you, Samson. Also here is Kesley um, Ato Coleman, he is complex emergencies expert and fellow of uh, Imani Africa. 
We will be going on the phone. Thank you for joining us, sir. We'll be going on the phone lines to speak to uh, some other of our guests who will assist us to unpack what the president announced yesterday. So let me start with the Ghana Medical Association. And Dr. Justice Youngson, you issued signed a statement asking for a lockdown. And I guess somebody actually called your bluff. Um, now, where we are is what we have to focus. Are we any late? Well, as far as we are concerned, I think it is not too late. Uh, of course, at the time we made the call, we knew that the president will have to also engage other stakeholders. Mm. Because if you look at the trajectory of this whole COVID-19, the two key areas are, one, health, of course. That is where the key issue is. But it also has some ramifications on the economy at large. So definitely, if you're going to take some action beyond the health bit, you need to rope in the other. So basically, we expected that by close of this week, we needed something like that. And thankfully, it has happened. All right. In the manner it has happened, is that what you expected? There are those who have already looked at it and say there appears to be the, that clause. We know this is an announcement. This is not the EI. That's the executive instrument, which will detail it in a way, in a way law has to. But the way it was announced, there appears to be one particular exemption that may make nonsense of the whole thing. That it is critical, but if you are providing that you can move out to do all the number of things that anybody is allowed to do, effectively, you may not get it as effective as you, you should. You agree? Well, to, to an extent, but you know, the president also sounded a caution that in as much as he's going to back, back this by law, the EI, mm -hmm. he sounded a caution to all of us that, look, if you don't comply, it's not like an appeal. But within that space, if you don't comply, then I have no option than to get the security agencies to be actually firm on everybody. Right. So I think it is in our common interest to ensure that we comply as much as possible. Mm. Great. Yes, uh, Atul, what do, you, what, do you, what do you say about what has happened, briefly? Yeah, I think uh, the president took the right step to, uh, in his speech. Uh, I mean, from the experiences that uh, you know, I had in, in Sierra Leone, I've participated in a shutdown and lockdown and stay at home before. So I think it, he did the right thing. Uh, what I liked was the strategic objectives for the lockdown. I think he was very clear. He said he, everybody should stay at home to halt the spread. Uh, then government wants to scale up contact tracing. Uh, government wants to test for more viruses. And then government wants to enforce and enhance isolation uh, treatment. So I think the measures that he articulated in terms of the strategic objectives for the two weeks lockdown for me as somebody who has worked in something similar like that before, what's, what's okay. But then, of course, there are some few gaps in, in, in his announcement. So I'm sure as we discuss, uh, we'll point out some of those gaps to strengthen right. the response. Yes. Right. Um, on Skype with us is Colonel Festus Abouaji, uh, retired. He's an author, conflict analyst, and um, member council on foreign relations, Ghana. Thank you for joining us, Colonel. Thanks a lot. Right. Um, what's your reading of the measures, additional measures that have been issued by the president? Well, I think the, the whole address is like a policy framework. So in terms of the operationalization of the exemptions, for instance, there is need for more clarity. How many persons, for instance, at any one time will be allowed to be walking to look for water or to look for food 
and so on and so forth. Or you take one of the paragraphs where the services are elaborated, I think it's paragraph 10. And in that paragraph, it says no transport will be allowed to enter the restricted area. So let's say that you have a truck that is bringing charcoal or bringing plantain or those kinds of staples that the people in Accra, for instance, or Kumasi or wherever, you know, rely on. Now, these items are brought into the restricted area to specific locations. But that's about the bulk. There are women and other persons who go to these areas to break the bulk. How do we allow such persons to access those commodity bulk breaking points? Under what conditions like social distancing and so forth? So there is a bit more need, there's need for a bit more of clarity on how the operational actors, the police, probably the military, are going to now determine how they interpret what a violation is, for instance. So we don't end up with a situation where innocent individuals who are genuinely going about procuring some of these services um, will now be victimized. What you are referring to is an exemption. But you are talking about mm -hmm. when it is brought to the destination, how uh, there's some sort of controlled process by which it, it, the distribution will happen. That's what you're asking. That, that's what I'm trying to allude to, that if you exempt trucks by way of trade, bringing commodities into the restricted area, that's a good exemption. Right. But the system that we have, socioeconomic system, is that these commodities are not sent to supermarkets. Our supermarkets are the individual women and men sitting by the roadside on tabletops, selling a bit of pineapples, a bit of plantain, a bit of uh, cassava. How do these women go to the bulk distribution areas where a truck full of plantain, for instance, has been brought into a restricted area within the greater Accra metropolitan area. The ministry, whichever the sector ministry is, or the police, need to issue operational instructions and offer or provide additional guidance on how these commodities can be distributed within the value chain to be available to individuals to access. Okay, so let's uh, find out if the police will have any difficulty. Will have any difficulty about this at all? Okay, so um, we are getting the uh, police on the line, and once we get the police spokesperson on the line, we will put those questions to because there definitely will be some difficulties about the implementation. So we need to know how the police is going to go about it, so it doesn't worsen the situation, yeah. but. Whilst it is being flexible, it will still be able to enforce in a certain strict sense that does not put everybody else in danger. The point that Colonel uh, Fesse Sabuaji, you know, raises, does it, does it resonate with you and which other areas do you think we need to pay attention to? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, in the first place, if, if we... Let's, Let's use two key sources of data for this discussion. Of course, uh, Act 1012, which gave the president the, 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 the power to uh, do the lockdown and shutdown. Imposition of restrictions. Imposition of restrictions. Act. Yes, mm. Act uh, 1012. And then the president's speech, you know, as, as the primary uh, or the secondary data for, to discuss it. Now, if you take the categories of Ghanaians and uh, institutions who are exempted, uh, it talks about production, distribution, and marketing of food, uh, beverages, medicine, paper, and plastics. So that means that anybody who works in the ports, in principle, should be part of this group. So those of us who are working in the logistics sector should be part of this group. I don't see that very clear. So probably it is an area that has to be strengthened. If you look at the definition 
or the reasons why you can uh, navigate through the restrictions. Says if you are going out for food, if you are going out for medicine, if you are going out for water, if you are going out for to the bank for money, and, and very importantly, if you are going out to the public toilet, yeah. um, you can come out of the restriction. Now, this definition means every Ghanaian will be exempted in principle. Now, if you then look at the second exemption, production, distribution, and marketing of food, beverages, medicine, etc., our market women are part of the distribution and marketing of essential goods, isn't it? Essential goods and services. So that therefore means that how is this a shutdown? Sorry, which, going which to essential effect? goods and services are you referring to? I'm talking about the, the categories of uh, Ghanaians who are exempted from mm -hmm. this uh, 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 restriction. The and essential services are clearly mentioned. The non mentioning of any other group is not, it's a clear indication that you are not part of it. Okay, so in that case, that's a good point. So in that yeah. case, that's the point I'm making. If you are saying that anybody who is involved with the production, distribution, marketing of food and uh, beer, be uh, 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 beverages, etc., mm -hmm. it means our market women are exempted. Okay. And if our market women are exempted, and you look at the number of people who, are, who work in our markets, and the fact that we go to our market, we have to come out of restriction for food, and we have to go to the market to buy food, it shows that this part of the operationalization of the strategy has to be tightened up. That's the point I want to make. Interesting, but you would have heard the president give an emphasis in his speech. We await the EI, and then we'll see if there are any finer detail that will be there. But he was categorical when he got to the market and said, in the market, it is not everything or everybody that's allowed. Those that are within the food chain. That was clear. Mm -hmm. So what's your difficulty with that? Let's go to the phone lines. I'll return to you to continue with that. Uh, the, let's, get, let's get on Skype and uh, get to meet Sheila Abiyye Bachman, Superintendent Sheila Abiyye Bachman, who is the Director of Public Affairs of the Ghana Police Service. Um, I suppose that you are, you are gearing up for the implementation because the president said you will implement this without fear or favor. Yes, Samson. Um, you know, the national security architecture had anticipated a possible um, safer restriction as it is now. And so some plans had been put in place. Um, although discussion is still ongoing to fine tune some of the other plans, basically what police is going to do will be supported by the Ghana Armed Forces. We will be supported by the Immigration Service, Custom Division of the Grand, uh, Revenue Authority, at the Ports and Harbors, the Ghana Port and Harbor Authority and several allied agencies. But we are going to have roadblocks, and then there will be snap checks. Mm. There would also be robust patrol by forts, by vehicles, and possibly by motorbikes as well. Mm. The roadblocks are going to be at the roads that lead out of or come into the areas that have been assigned by the president. Right. And so we are looking at roads leading into Accra or that take people out of Accra, roads that lead people into Tema or take people out of Tema, roads that lead people into the areas in Kumase that were mentioned, mm. and then roads that lead people into exiting Kaswa and uh, Ewutu Senya East. Right. These roads will be blocked. Right. And if anybody attempts to access them, the person will be asked to do a roundabout, um, a U-turn back into the area where he or she is coming from. Okay. It may in not be difficult. Of, okay, go ahead. Um, within the areas in Accra, Kumase, Tema, and Kaswa, where you cannot exit or come into, the president has directed that people 
can go out on a limited basis to have essential items such as food, medicine, water, undertake bank transactions. And we are prepared to assist people who would have to necessarily go out in this direction. Mm. Um, discussion is ongoing. Um, possibly the municipal assemblies would have to shut down some of the kiosks and stores and saloons and barbering shops and seamstress shops um, in and around the areas that we are going to ensure that people do not exit or come into from Monday. Okay. Do you, you are likely to face a very um, a, 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 a huge difficulty. Tell me how you will, you will navigate that. Road and railway construction workers, will they have to show you their ID cards that they work for a particular company before they allowed mining workers, uh, fisher folk, uh, of course, members of the security, security agencies, not difficult to um, identify. Staff of electricity company, not difficult to uh, tell. Telecommunication companies, e-commerce, digital service providers. How are you going to identify people involved in the production, distribution, and marketing of food, beverages, and someone going to buy medicine? Um, how do you make the judgment that they are actually going to buy medicine, someone going attending nature's call uh, to a public toilet, how do you identify them? At Samson, many of the exempted groups do have identification cards, but we also reckon that some of them may not have identification cards, like the Fisher Folk and um, some of the construction workers that you're talking about. So this operation is going to be really integrated. Like I said, apart from getting the MMDAs, we are working with the other agencies and ministries to have to come to some common terms between today and maybe by close of tomorrow, to have to come some common terms of, on how we can identify these people. Mm -hmm. If it means issuing them with some form of a pass, that will be done. There are several alternatives on board. Okay. And we're hoping mm. that when we start with this implementation, we will continuously evaluate and review and re-strategize until the two weeks is up. And if it means that we will have to extend it as per the presidential directive, it will be done. So all these options have been thought of, and it is on discussion on the table. Great. Um, so... Can I first say, are you getting the comforts that you are seeking in the enforcement of um, the new additional measures that have come in? I'm not too sure about that. What I'm saying that is this. The lady who spoke said that by close of, of course, there's no work tomorrow. So by nightfall tomorrow, when you wake up, 1 a.m. Monday morning, which is in the wee hours of the morning, this restriction is in force. As of now, we have not set the framework for the identification. Who is a nurse? Who is a doctor? Who is electricity corporation or whatever worker? These experiences are part of occasion to share on social media, where things that we did in the bad days of coups and revolutions, the persons who manage these arrangements are still alive, some of them. Some may even still be in the services, armed forces, police. We are running after the shadow. When we knew that the president was going to make this announcement, and I believe it's been imminent for a while, the respective sector ministries, should have set in place the operational aspects of the policy that the president outlined. Um, I don't think we've done that yet. My worry, my concern, is about innocent victims, people who might be beaten up by security forces or probably even shot. 
you know, that's one concern that I, I'm, I'm very uh, particular about. But well, why? If they why why? Beating, around, yes. beating, beating anybody is not part of the mm -hmm. enforcement process. Shooting anybody Precisely. perhaps is not part of the enforcement process. So why is that? Yes. Why, why does that come to your mind in the first place? Because in, re in the recent past, we've had ex experiences, episodes of the abuse of power on the side of the authorities. There is no reason for me not to think that under this current arrangement, when people are already mentally stressed by being restricted to very narrow spaces, that they're not going to be, you know, tempted to ease that tension. I mean, I stay at Pokwasi ACT Estate. My bank is Sanchez. The nearest bank to me is either on the Ring Road or I go to Opebia. You see the distance that I need to travel in order to go and find money, assuming that I need to take the cash. So there are individuals who may have to walk long distances. But the nurse who has been exempted may come and stand by the roadside looking for trotro. You agree that of the you agree that these measures activity. you agree that these measures yes. are necessary. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. do you assess that process? Well, that's what I'm saying that the respective sector ministry institutions must work out a certain arrangement of identity, the operational aspects of the execution of that policy framework. This must be disseminated very widely for everybody to know how the police will go about stopping, interrogating, assisting, and so on. Let me give you one example. Take Osu Night Market. That is, that is a big restaurant. That is where guns go to buy their dinner, to go and eat. How is the police or the local authorities, for that matter, going to police that environment to make it possible for guns to go out and buy their kente in the night and their fish to go and eat without being labeled as violating uh, the restriction? So what's our so problem elsewhere? Yes. Elsewhere, these restrictions have been imposed, and the people are complying, and the law enforcement agencies are enforcing mm -hmm. them appropriately. Why do we have fears here in Ghana? In New York, essentials are allowed. People can mm -hmm. go out and get their essentials. Why, why, do we have pro why do we think that's not possible here? Because of our recent culture, I, I made reference to that. You and I are here, and mm -hmm. we've seen cases of police, you know, brutally assaulting individuals, rightly even if they have violated regulation. The way and manner in which these uh, suspects or whoever are handled gives me cause for pause. So I'm only cautioning that the instructions that the police issued, for instance, which leaked on social media and were redrawn, were very, very short on the action drills, the procedures mm. that the police must use in executing the arrest of violations and the enforcement of the lockdown and so on and so forth. These details must be out and disseminated on many uh, media platforms so that we can get that, you know, uh, convergence of understanding okay. on the part of the authorities, on the part of the citizens. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you've expressed your concerns there and suggested some... Uh, ways by which you can go to that. But um, uh, um, Sheila, can you help us? First of all, do you have the numbers? Because you need the numbers. Do you have the numbers to be everywhere in the places where these restrictions have been imposed to ensure full compliance? Because our lives depend on the enforcement. <laughs> Yes, Samson, um, Colonel Abaji may have a genuine fear, but the assurance and the good news is that we have also thought about these and strategized. In terms of numbers, on Friday, the Inspector General of Police caused a signal to be issued to all police personnel and actually recalling even those who are on leave. And so in the country, we have about over 35,000 police officers who will be deployed not only as police officers, but together with the Ghana Armed Forces, 
with the support of other security agencies, the Bureau of National Investigations and all. The operations will also be overt and covert. Like I said, there are still discussions on board. You see, the president did not ban movement totally within the areas of operation. Okay. The president directed that motorbikes, for instance, can ride, except that they cannot carry pillion riders. Right. Trotros, a limited number of trotros will work, but it is about the seating. And that is why we are not doing this alone. We are in touch with the agencies and ministries that work closely with leaders of these groups so that we can all come to some agreement. Some agreements have already been reached that I may not be able to put out now, but in the coming days, maybe by close of tomorrow, we would know the fine details that we have to know. Mm -hmm. But the assurance is that we're going to employ democratic policing strategies. As I said, if we find you on the street, we may even escort you to go to the bank, you may, because we are going to be in our numbers, both in plain clothes and in uni uniform, because we do know that it is not everybody who is comfortable in, the, uh, uh, in being escorted by a uniformed person. So we are only appealing to people that we should try to stay home. Staying home is for your benefit as well as for my benefit. It is just for a short period after which things might change and we will all come back to town to do what we have to do. But we necessarily must enforce these directives <coughs> to make them workable. <coughs> and that is why we are not working alone. We, we, we want to assure you and the public that the processes ongoing are transparent. The processes are thinking about um, possible, you know, we have done SWOT analysis. And so all these shades of opinion that have come out are being considered. And so uh, other things that possibly people might not have even anticipated continue. There will be snap checks. And so we, we, we may even find you coming out of your house before you even get onto the streets. Mm. And we are employing negotiation tactics as part of our operation strategy mm. to get people to feel safe even as we enforce the directives that's very 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 assuring particularly the manner of policing that you say you intend to do um, in the latter part of your pre presentation uh, the president says that everyone resident in these areas must stay at home for the next two weeks However, if you must go out, it must only be to get essential items such as food, medicine, water, undertake banking transactions, or to use public toilet facilities. But as much as possible, stay at home. Once again, I don't know if I got a specific direct answer to that question. You will be in these communities. You will be in these localities, in your numbers, correct? Yes, we will. Right. Do you have the numbers? We know fighting coronavirus is a multi-sectoral approach. Whilst we are looking for how many, you know, retired and um, young nurses to bring on board, Elsewhere in the UK, they asked for about uh, 40,000 uh, or so. They got half a million, you know, nurses who are coming in as volunteers to assist. Do you have the numbers? The numbers will be uh, supported by other agencies. I have mentioned the Ghana Armed Forces. Great. I have mentioned the Bureau of National Investigation. Mm -hmm. I have mentioned the Immigration Service and other security agencies. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it is a multi-sectoral approach. And so we are going to employ every available support to do this. And particularly for people who will have to go out for essential items as listed by the president and just repeated by you, we will even 
facilitate that particular movement. And there are cases where you may find our officers and the other officers I have mentioned escorting them to carry out these uh, assigned or uh, essential engagements. That's, and that's very nice home. and assuring, but as Colonel Fesu Zabwaji uh, uh, expressed his concern, the excesses. How are you going to work on the excesses so that we don't have, you know, people being, as it were, manhandled instead of being assisted properly by the police? Something. Our officers and the officers that will carry out these assignments, patrol, whether it is about snap check, whether it is about enforcing roadblock, whether it is about traffic management or escort duties, okay. will adequately be briefed. Um, even if we will have to employ force under certain restricted circumstances that um, may arise, it will be graduated force that that will be equal to the kind of force we probably may be encountering. But as much as possible, the police administration is very ready. The inspector general has already ordered that force that is not practical to democratic policing mm. should <laughs> not be used. Okay. Um, I, I will let you uh, take leave of us, but a couple of questions have come in. I will be done with you shortly, and then we can speak to um, uh, Kenneth Fesu Sabwadye and Professor uh, Godfrey Bokwin to tell us about what appears to be some stimulus package to assist everybody else. There are people who are asking questions. We are supposed to be active during this period. People need to exercise. Those who have sort of the privilege to live in areas that they want to take a walk, they want to, you know, uh, run, do a few things. How are they going to do that? Thank you. So, uh, Samson, people must stay at home. As a police officer, I can tell you that I am able to exercise daily in the comfort of my room or my office. Exercising does not necessarily mean that you have to go onto the streets and be walking or be talking to other people. Stay at home and find exercises that you can perform at home to stay fit. All right. So if you went into the market on Monday afternoon and you saw market uh, women and men who were dealing in something other than uh, in the food chain, will they be arrested? The CJ has issued some guidelines also. We this is not the time to take people into, into custody to... and put them in, in, in uh, as it were, remand. Um, Samson, we are talking and we have already spoken to leaders of the various markets. Like you said, it is a multi-sectoral approach. And we are hoping that the engagement that has already started will continue and our markets, women and men, will comply. Um, you would have noticed that even our police cells, we have tried not to pack people there because we want to ensure the social distancing. So as much as possible, we do not want to arrest people anyhow. Lee. And that is why <laughs> I am hoping that by the end of this discussion, by the end of your program, people would have accepted the fact that they need to stay at home for their own benefit, for their own safety, and for the safety of the general public. How, um, how am I to be assured that the person talking to me and instructing me has the power to instruct me. Do you have some people who be in mufti? Our police officers mostly, I said they would be in uniform and plain clothes, but mostly, and it is not just police officers, it will also be military officers. Mostly will be the, it will be the uniformed officers that will engage people and persuade them to perhaps return to their homes or um, escort them if they need the necessary assistance. Our police officers will be wearing their names 
our soldiers will also be wearing their names. You can ask for identification if you are not sure. But then again, you may want to also call our 18555 operational number if you doubt it. But the assurance is that you would not see police officers working in singles. And so you would be able to verify even from the police officer or the military officer or the security agent who is nearby to assist you. Thank you very much, Sheila Kesi Abiyye Bakman. Thank you very much for your time, uh, Director of Public Affairs of the Ghana Police Service. Uh, I'm sure it's early days yet, so as we begin to roll out everything starting um, uh, tomorrow also, the media will continue, the media that has been left out of the exemption which I have asked, and I'm getting some assurance that the media um, has been catered for in the in the EI, that is the law that the president is supposed to issue to back the statement he made yesterday. Um, we'll continue to do the education and assist so that people don't get into situations that bring confusion and to bring them in you know, conflict with the police or the law enforcement agencies. All right. so. Um, I'll re return to my guests in the studio, but before we do that, let's go and finish up with uh, Colonel Fester Sabwaji, and then I'll get uh, Professor Bokwing to help us to understand um, the, is it a tax relief? I'm, I'm not sure it's a tax relief, uh, how much of it, uh, and then the monies that are coming in for um, small-scale businesses. The president actually mentioned homes. Um, how all that is going to happen. So, Colonel uh, um, Fester Sabwaji retired. I'm, I'm sure that having listened to the police up to this point, you are setting that we can all cooperate in a manner that makes this effective. Definitely, we all need to cooperate. But this is in the interest of not ourselves, but of the entire society. So we all need to cooperate. But there are genuine needs, you know. Um, my concern, because the, the, the security of this country, for that matter, any society, depends on the lowest common denominator. Those individuals who make their living by selling pure water, or selling plantain chips, who are now no longer able to, you know, generate that amount of income to be able to survive. The policy framework is not very clear whether the reliefs that are being outlined in that framework extend to, for instance, kitchens being set up or food parcels being given out. See, unless we do that, then we have this security dimension that certain categories of affected persons might break the law through armed robberies or through attacks and so on. Right. Uh, which will further, you know, um, degenerate the, the, the security uh, situation. So that's one concern I have. But if you may allow me, I'm not an expert in this uh, hospital equipment. But... Many years ago, I deployed to Liberia with 500 soldiers. We had one armored vehicle. The armored vehicle had a certain number of rounds. I cannot remember the exact quantity. But when we used the rate of fire of that weapon on the MOAC, it turned out that if we had to defend only one position with that one vehicle platform, within 12 minutes, the rounds would all be finished. So I'm looking at the numbers of the categories of equipment in paragraph 15 and asking if a face mark has to be worn for five hours and discarded, and we're only bringing in 350,000 masks. On paper, it looks nice. But technically, how many health personnel will be equipped 
with this 350,000. I thought the understanding so was that, that the understanding yes, was that we ahead. have a lot more coming in and that it's 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 a process it's ongoing and mm -hmm. really like like uh, Donald Trump will repeat over and again nobody planned for this right yeah but it's been it's been more than 3 months isn't it since this uh, pandemic started evolving mm. and the devil is in the detail okay. the, the broad assurance that more are coming uh, may be reassuring but not so much because there are no timelines attached to how many of which type of equipment do we expect by the end of next week, by the end of... Um, Sir, uh, but do you also so acknowledge the difficulty that even the advanced countries where these things are being produced, they need more. Mm -hmm. They don't have. Their systems mm -hmm. have been stretched. So mm -hmm. African countries more particularly, you know, have to be cautious in giving timelines because they cannot guarantee that they will have them. No, not exactly. You asked a question to, I think, the first segment or the first session. Right. What are the projections, for instance, for the face mask? Is it that we need one million and we have 350, and these are the timelines to make up the shortfall of 650,000? I'm trying to suggest that. And I'm talking from experience about the conditions under which this quarantine has evolved. It started with little or no planning about the operational aspects. Mm. And then we bought time by now evolving a plan. You see, I won't be surprised that this restriction and the operational enforcement aspects might evolve along the same line. So I'm calling on the authorities to be a bit more specific. What are the projections? What are the availabilities? Right. What are the shortfalls? <clears throat> okay. What are the plans to meet the shortfalls, mm -hmm. for instance? All right. Thank you very much. Because uh, I have a son who is a doctor, mm -hmm. whose wife is a doctor. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Right. I need to be sure that not they alone, but every health worker right. is adequately uh, protected. Right. Thank you very much. Um, sometime, sometime last week, uh, by the time that uh, Italy had not yet even you know, brought out the clear uh, numbers of the health professionals who had uh, died as a result of uh, COVID-19, we're told that about 20 of the doctors had died in the line of duty. So uh, I think Colonel Abouadje is right about that, spot on about that. The protection must be comprehensive. Police and all the people who are being deployed to enforce the law will also need <clears throat> to protect themselves um, in that regard. Let's get Professor uh, Bokwing, economist and professor of finance at the University of Ghana, uh, to uh, share with us his understanding of uh, what you may call our stimulus package and the packages for vulnerable, for companies, we have, uh, we have 1 billion Ghana cities that the finance minister has been ordered to work on, working with parliament, which will go to households and businesses, particularly small and medium scale enterprises. Um, we also have, um, uh, is it a 3 billion facility to support industry, especially in the pharmaceutical, hospitality, services, service and manufacturing sectors. There is the grant of uh, a period where you can hold on with paying your taxes or filing your taxes until a certain time. How, how, how does this benefit the system in the current circumstances? We take a quick break. We return. Professor Bokwin will start us off on that. And then my guest in the studio will take the rest of the time to deal with the other aspects of the additional measures. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This is News File, the most authoritative news analysis platform. Um, now we can get to Dr. Uh, Professor Bokping. Uh, Prof. Bokwin, thank you very much for your patience uh, on the line, as I mean Skype. 
Okay. So we'll get Professor Bokwin back to look at um, the mitigating um, financial measures that uh, government has uh, taken, how, whether they are far-reaching enough or sufficient or inadequate or whatever it is. Of course, we are in a time that all of us must learn to be cooperative and to sacrifice for both individual and the collective good. Right. So let me come back to Dr. Justice Yangson. Do you see clearly that there are difficulties that will be encountered in enforcing these measures? Well, truth be told, we, 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 we may encounter some difficulties. I'm using the word may because a lot will depend on how the citizens themselves comport themselves, how they comply to these measures. But at all times, one thing I want people to bear in mind is that this is for our common good. It is a sacrifice we are making for our own selves. Look, if you want to see how bad the situation is, just watch CNN for an hour <laughs> and see the way and manner COVID-19 is devastating the very solid structures that we find elsewhere. So in the United States, you can talk about New York. I mean, New York is a big state. It's a huge state, not in terms of the land size, but in terms of what it represents as far as the world and America is concerned. New Jersey is equally, you know, solid. And all of them are basically mm. being destroyed in the process. If you go to Europe, Italy, Spain, it, it, you just cannot imagine. So people should understand that one, we have difficulties in our health system itself. <laughs> and if we don't allow ourselves to be part of these preventive measures, such that in the process, we all stay safe. If the reverse should happen, i.e., we disobey what is happening, we all get ourselves infected. Look, the health system cannot handle, it cannot cope, we'll be overwhelmed, and a lot more lives will be lost, like we are seeing now. The so best of health are, systems are already stretched. They can't handle this situation. I can't imagine Ghana getting into that situation. And I say, God forbid, else we will be overwhelmed and we'll be damned. Professor Bokwin, looking at the financial mitigating you know, steps, measures that the government is rolling out, what do you say? Good morning, and good morning to our cherished viewers uh, um, all over the world. Thank you once um, again for your patience. This, this is a little bit too much for us as a country, from the financial point of view. Um, just barely two months into the implementation of the 2020 budget, the assumptions are no longer valid. And it's just because of one virus, coronavirus. So it's as simple as that. In these times, regardless of whatever stimulus package, whatever monetary policy intervention, all over the world, they are not being considered as enough. And for that matter, what Ghana just announced really cannot be said to be enough. But for us, perhaps, we can't give what we don't have. Mm -hmm. In fact, even before this virus, we didn't even have the physical space as a country. And let me say that we were just lucky. Maybe, or the Ministry of Finance and Bank of Ghana got it precisely right. The, the, the manner and the time within which they did the euro bond. If they had waited a few weeks, it would have been, it would have been something else. Because the, practically, the market is shut. It's as simple as that. But thankfully, we locked in the three billion dollars. So, so when you look at the, the the interventions that have come, I'm I'm not too sure at this stage we can call it um, a, a stimulus uh, because um, it's very very small and small to maybe our space and the struggle that we have and all of that. I believe that the full determination is going to come out when the Minister of Finance is done with the, with the uh, cor coronavirus um, um, uh, alleviation program. Right. Then we'll get to see the details of what government intends to do. But baseline, what 
perhaps we can work with now, I don't know when it's going to be available actually, is the one billion CDs government has announced. Um, and, and my hope and my prayer is that we will prioritize households and individuals who are more vulnerable, the KIAs and all those who are more vulnerable with practically no shock absorbers. Industries are complaining, but perhaps they sorry, may sorry, have Sorry, doesn't it, doesn't it appear to you that for the very, very vulnerable, as you refer to, it is rather the fund that is intended to take care of them? You remember, the president announced a fund to which um, the former chief justice, uh, Sophia Kufu, will head, and then he committed the next three months of his salary as seed capital in that fund. Do you think that, do you not uh, understand that that is rather the fund that is supposed to cater for, you know, the vulnerable, and then the money, one billion, is supposed to go for small businesses and so on? Look, um, when you do a lockdown, that takes immediate effect, or, or more or less, from Monday. Who are more exposed in this instance? Whose economic flow or activities will be disrupted the more? I think they are the, the vulnerable. They are the vulnerable. So I, I understand the perspective you are coming from. But I believe that we, we, need, we need to do something that gives greater hope to the vulnerable. Because in, in these times, they are more exposed. They have no shock absorbers. And that is where compliance may be difficult. And enforcement of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the directive may be a bit problematic. Because it doesn't have to get to the point where somebody would, would then come to the conclusion that when I stay in my room, I'm going to die. When I go out, I'm going to die. They, they, they are certainly going to make a decision. Mm. And all of that. So I understand the difficulties that we, we find ourselves in. I mean, the U.S. just did a, a two trillion dollars. That's several times Ghana's GDP. Mm. And and even that one, it, it's not considered enough. All it's right. not considered enough. So in fact, the president but, said the president said he has established a COVID nineteen fund to be managed by an independent board of trustees and chaired by former Chief Justice Sophia Kufu to receive contributions and donations from the public to assist in the welfare of the needy and the vulnerable. So it, it may appear that part of the one billion may be available for the vulnerable as well, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah that is why I'm saying that let's prioritize the vulnerable, the extremely mm. vulnerable. Because the point is when you are making an appeal, you don't have control over that. But what government promises will be based on some analysis that it can be available. Mm. And, and that is what I, we should focus on, how individuals are going to respond to that appeal and how that fund is going to be administered with, 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 with a kind of informal sector, lack of data and all of that. I believe that we, 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 I don't have control over that. But, but what is coming from the fiscal perspective in terms of the stimulus, my, under, my, my considered view is that let's prioritize the extremely vulnerable. Because the point is that they have practically no shock absorbers. They mm. have no buffers. Yeah. And, and I believe that something, you might have been getting um, a WhatsApp or from friends, your baba and all of that, about some kind of uh, fiscal stimulus for them to even stock for a day or two or so. You are right. That exactly is how challenging right. it is for, for those people. And I'm sure you've done your own personal That's stimulus. That's right to friends and families and all of that. Okay, so we, we all have a role to play, and I agree. And I joined the call in Ghanaians, high net worth individuals, mm. the world to do, to reach out, extend a hand of fellowship to, to the less fortunate, to the, to the more vulnerable, the socially excluded, the marginalized, and all of that. So we, we, we can what, only go far when, what do you when say, we are together. And what do you say together. about the extension of the tax filing dates from April to June, and then 2% reduction of interest rates uh, by the bank's effective 1st April, the granting by the banks of six-month moratorium of principal repayments to entities in the airline and hospitality industries. And he specified hotels, restaurants, car rentals, food vendors, taxis, and Uber operations. Then said all other sector 
credit exposures will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, thank you very much, Samson. I think that, that, is, that is good news largely, and, and, and it is not out of proportion to ask for more in terms of uh, also mortgage payments and all of that. So they are very, very important. But there are some is of it, the is it that would have to be accommodated through business activities that you get those reliefs if you are doing business, uh, and then the postponement of the filing of the returns mm -hmm. and all of that. These are good gestures. What, what that also means from the fiscal side is that it's going to have implication for government revenue envelope in terms of the projections that have been made. But of course, I'm sure it is common knowledge Prof, now. Should it be a postponement, should it be a postponement of filing of the tax, or Extension. it should be a postponement as an extension of the period, or it should be a waiver, a freeze? Well, I, I think that the um, government finds itself in a difficult situation because they don't want to open the cap on borrowing that much. So when you do, when you do some gestures along the lines that would impact negatively your revenue envelope, then it's going to have implication for the stimulus that you want to be able to dish out there. Then if you don't take care, then it will result in a lot of borrowing. And I believe that that has to be managed carefully. But the reality on the ground is that as gradually economic activities are coming to uh, a halt, um, practically VAT issues do not matter that much because they also they are akin to flow of activities in the economy. Mm. So, so because I'm asking because elsewhere, and I'm not saying our economy is comparable to what example I want to give, but of course, I go to Kenya. In Kenya, mm. Kenyatta announced 100% tax relief for workers. Why yeah, can't we do that? In fact, elsewhere, salaries mm. are going to be paid whilst you are home. Clear Precisely. steps the, known. The, 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 Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you, like the U.S. and U.K. Yes. So once, once you do a total lockdown and businesses no longer, in, in other words, you are truncating the going concern of businesses. And nobody is handsome or beautiful enough to maintain a presence on a payroll if you can't justify that by the, by the flow of, of cash. Then in that case, the government must come in and, and support the payroll. So in some countries, they are covering the payroll role to about 80% or so, and then in the U.S. and all of that. In fact, the, the, the numbers have increased since recording started in the U.S. Right. in terms of number of Americans who are making claims for unemployment mm. uh, interventions. They, they so are, they they are running in the 2 million, as, uh, 3 million or so far. Pardon? About 3 million so far. Of what? Unemployed. Yes. Yes, in the U.S. And, and the question is, do we even have the data for Ghana? If we want to support them in terms of the informal sector right. and all of that. Apart mm. from that, once, once you are imposing restrictions, es essentially, you are interfering in the business model that uh, companies use is going to have implication for their projections for the year. Mm. But I also do understand that these are unusual times. These are extraordinary times. Mm. So nobody can come out of it as a winner, necessarily, when we, when we measure performance in terms of profit. So we all have to take a haircut in one way or the other. We mm. all have to make some adjustments. Okay. We all have to make some trade-offs. And I would appeal to Ghanaians that when you do policy prescriptions, it's based on assumptions. One of them is that every Ghanaian would respond positively to all the measures that have been announced. Okay. Because when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to security and all of that, a lot depends on us as individuals. Right. Putting our health ahead of perhaps everything else. Exactly. And the president and then, said that. The president said that. He said we know what to do to bring back our economy back to life. What we do not know is how, uh, how to do is to bring people back to life. We mm. know how to bring our economy back to life 
what we do not know how to do is to bring people yeah. back to life. Does that suggest to you also that the president is ready to open the chest and, and spend as much because we can, we can bring the economy back when it, uh, it's, it's, in a sleep, it's in a sleep mode now? We can bring yeah. it back, but we can't bring life back. So he's ready to spend so much. That, that assurance is, is very good. Certainly, um, we cannot be talking about debt to GDP ratio around this time. And then the normal conditions under the Fiscal Responsibility Act, mm. in other words, the threshold of 5%, mm. certainly not. All right. These are unusual times, and therefore it calls for unusual uh, physical measures. All right. It's going to be painful. The real effect of that will be seen uh, perhaps post-COVID-19, right. when we begin to count the cost and how the economy is going to absorb all of that. But right now, because we are in a crisis situation, um, we, we want to focus our attention, physical, monetary, health, the various uh, cross-sectorial issues to getting out of this. And then the, the easiest thing to talk about in terms of um, restarting will be the economy. Once you die, resurrection lies mm. only in the Bible. Mm. It doesn't lie with the president. Right. And that is why individuals must take health seriously. I mean, look, the effectiveness of the lockdown, whether we do a total lockdown or the partial or the variation that we are doing, depends on you and I. It depends on ordinary Ghanaians. Mm. It's very, very critical. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Bokwing of the University of Ghana, um, helping us to understand the the money aspects of uh, this uh, relief uh, that the president, you know, gave. Uh, this program, as always, is brought to you by MTN Everywhere You Go, Bank of Africa, strong as a group and close as a partner. Amen Scientific, God is a healer. Duraplus, where Duraplus goes, water flows. Coa FS, that's your immune boost booster. You need that now than ever. Way lead, we build homes for you. Enjoy learning keep learning so in the midst of the tragedy you can continue to learn in the midst of this disaster uh, you can continue to learn all you need is your joy learning and by that you need a digibox uh, gets that fixed and then your children who are at home will uh, begin to do things of course um, it's been about two weeks of having their kids at home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you can imagine that uh, it's not easy no. right so you're welcome back this is news file is your most authoritative news analysis platform and here on news file we always put ghana first so um, let's uh, get to begin to get towards uh, wrapping up our discussion. And my guest in the studio still, Dr. Justice Yangson, General Secretary, Ghana Medical Association. He's also a lawyer. And Kesley Atu Coleman is complex emergencies expert and the fellow of Imani Africa. Okay, so gentlemen, um, what's are your areas of concentration that you want to bring attention to first in cooperatively helping to educate the people or bring policymakers attention to to ensure that everything goes smoothly thank you Samson. thank you. i think the first thing is i have some concern with the way we are using the concepts of, of the lockdown we are mixing up issues and it's affecting the communication explain yeah. So a lockdown has several aspects. If you have a curfew, it's a lockdown. If you have an internet uh, shutdown, it's a lockdown. If you close your borders, it's a lockdown. If you have a stay-at-home measure, it's a lockdown. These two weeks, is a stay-at-home. Mm. You know, And so it's very important for us to be very clear about that. Now, a stay-at-home measure is to give the responders or the people providing leadership for the response time to gather data and then also strengthen the strategy. Mm. So we are looking at a situation where the president 
is saying that anybody who came into the country from 3rd March to when the deadline to close the borders was announced is going to be what? Tested. We are estimating that to be like 50 to 70,000 people. And if you look at the data of the number of imported cases that have come in and the, and the rate of infection of those who came in, that is a very significant number. So I think that is the reason why it's important for Ghanaians to support the government during these times. Mm. Okay, We are looking at a disease that poses an existential threat to this country. Mm. So it's, it's not a joke. Yeah. So that is very important. I was the a little surprised, very important. though, that the Ghana Health Service director said it's not a killer disease. It is. That is why <laughs> this disease has killed more people than Ebola. And Ebola was even fatal mm. in terms of survival rates. But this has killed more than you. So if people are saying that, oh, you know, COVID-19, uh, it, 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 it's not serious like Ebola, they should be careful. If we are looking at possibly 50 to 70,000 people who are in the system right now, who we are now going to look out for to test. It's, it's possible that there are a lot of risks that we are facing, number one. Number two, the bit about the, the omission of the of, of journalists, for me, was a big concern. That's why uh, I'm happy that I think efforts are being made to correct that, you know, it, because this is a war situation, so you can have omissions. So it's fine to correct it. But this is very important because when you are managing a complex response like this, you need to be guided by the humanitarian standards. And the humanitarian standards lay out some key principles. First one is do no harm. Second one is show people dignity. Third one is give them, as they have the right to assistance. The fourth one is you have to respect their tradition, their customs, and then their culture. And then you also have to be impartial. Mm. So what we are saying is that for me, for the next two weeks, the journalists and civil society organizations and Ghanaians in general should hold government to account in terms of the extent to which these principles are respected during the next two weeks. It's very important. So that's why I'm going to, I'm encouraging all journalists to read the 200, 2018 core humanitarian standards, and which is the basis for the WHO guidelines on how to manage the mm. response. Very important. The third bit is the management of the response. Okay? If you look at the president's uh, speech, all his speeches, he, he gives a broad overview of the outcomes he's looking at. He says he wants to limit and stop the importation of uh, 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 COVID-19. He wants to contain the spread. He wants to ensure adequate care for sick people. He wants to limit the impact on the economy. That's why the discussion with Professor Bopin was very interesting and all the packages that has been, are being put in place to target pro-poor interventions and then inspire the expansion of the domestic capacity and deep in self-reliance. For me, the last part shows that the president is thinking of resilience. When you, when you are faced with an adversity, you need to build capacities to cope with that adversity and bounce back. That is why those measures are very important. Now, so it means going forward, the management of the response has to be very important. Now, what are some of the key things that sh should guide us as we hold government to account? Number one, the response and, and the strategy during the next two weeks has to be driven by core values of respect and dignity, number one. Number two, the organizational model how you manage technical experts, those in operations, those in logistics, the epidemiologists, the laboratories, you know, the, those in transport. You are bringing together so many expertise, but you need to be able to manage them. You need to define decision space. You need to define decision mandate, and there should be clarity on reporting line so that you minimize duplication of efforts. Because one of the things I've seen is that coordination can be an issue. You have people mean well, they want to support the government, but you need to coordinate all these resources. Mm -hmm. Because during emergency situations, there are also risks of so many uh, exposure to fraud. Uh, that is why, and corruption, and abuse of human rights. So these are some of the things that has to be mm -hmm. taken into account. And the last bit is the human resource aspect, the focus on health workers. You know, we need to have incentives for them during these times, when they are very much exposed. We need to invest in the capabilities for testing, capabilities for the well with all, and also even giving them continuous training as they go about all this right. response. So I think these for me, these are some of the areas mm. that government okay. should be able to All right, thank on. you very much. So Dr. Yangsin, wh when you were asking for this uh, lockdown, uh, lockdown according to my dictionary is simply a state of isolation or restricted access instituted as a security measure. So whatever grade <laughs> you have it, <laughs> this is a lockdown. No. Um, were you looking for two weeks of course it's subject to review but the practice so far has been to look at at least a month or two 
why are we looking at two weeks? Well, it's, it's something that is also a bit dependent on what you have in the system. You know, it looks like, for now, we've all come to accept that the incubation period for the virus is about two weeks. Mm. Of course, the studies seem to be pointing to something slightly more. And throughout the activity, the president has been using this two weeks approach. So when we called for the lockdown, we knew that as much as possible, the president will limit it to some two weeks and then review as we move along. For me, whether it was two weeks or a month, we shouldn't be so worried about it. Once we have a window for that review to happen, in fact, the review can even happen next week if the president thinks that what is happening now is not good enough or we are not cooperating enough, he can decide to add on to. So as of now, I think the focus should be what is the essence of the lockdown. It's to achieve one particular aim, to break the chain of transmission. And by that, all we are saying is that to one, ensure that people do not get new infections in our society. Mm. Of course, just like the president said, the other bits around is that it gives us room to do our contact tracing properly and ensure that at least we've also picked up all potential contacts, all potential suspected cases, test, 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 test them properly to be sure that we do not have a lot more of the problems in our community. What we all don't want now, which is why we also ask for the lockdown, is that the community spread is what is going to be our bait. So now that we have the important cases being in the majority, i.e. about 97%, the 3%, we need to ensure that we don't escalate that percentage in exponential figures that will lead us to the path of destruction. Now, we also accept that from the results of the quarantine bit that happened, the mandatory quarantine, where the first set of 185 people who were tested, we had 25 positive. What he told all of us on the health front is that the days preceding the lockdown, the lockdown of the airports, the borders, mm. that two-day mandatory period, what we picked, clearly the days preceding those days, most likely people had filtered into the community. So we went on that presumptive position that the disease is already in our community and we needed to tackle the disease head on. So at this point where we find ourselves in this lockdown, what I want people to understand is that it is not a comfortable situation. We ourselves, as we stated in our uh, release, release yeah. that mm -hmm. there's going to be discomfort and what have you, but it's for a common good, as I said earlier. Two, people should also not forget about the preventive measures. You may be locked down at home, but because we are mindful of potential community spread, as much as possible, especially for those who live in compound houses and what have you, we should try and still practice that social distancing that we've been talking about. It is very important. And then, of course, the frequent washing of hands, the use of sanitizers and what have you, mm. we should be able to do all of them. And then for the health force, unfortunately, it looks like uh, your name was not really mentioned in the list of exemptions. And I think we need to cure this. If you look at the act itself, the IRE, the Imposition of Restrictions Act 1012, you need, it's clearly defined in there that we are essential services. Okay. But because the president went on to mention, mm. we mm. expect that in the EI, mm. if it was an omission, the that health should service be put so in be, there. Be, okay. Because we need right. that freedom to be able to move okay. around and work for people. Thank you all so very much. much uh, we run out of time. And we're continuing, at the, continuing the programming. Uh, you are going to see, uh, you know, footages of people who are rushing. There's a mad rush for goods and services as the lockdown, you know, uh, begins. And so here on Joy News, on Midday News, we are bringing you uh, what is happening. You drive through uh, gas uh, filling stations and you see they are not even practicing the social distancing yes, as the queues to begin to pile up. It's not the best. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Youngson and... Um, Atu Coleman. I am Samson Ladia Yanini. This has been News File. We come your way again next week.
God willing, let's pray that we all practice the safety precautions so that we'll be alive to tell the story of how things went. My outfit, as always, is by Letida.